mute myself. So we now have participants back. Yep, I can hear you. This is good. Yeah. One, two, three. One, two, three. So you might let everybody know we're going to start in two minutes. Okay. We're going to get started in just two minutes, folks. By the time we get to this afternoon or tomorrow evening, I'll be okay. Then I'll be able to have this down. Oh, yeah, I'll be talking about four o'clock tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. That's the way it works. I think you got it now. You might check your uh, check the uh, clicker to make sure it's moving up because I have unmuted, so it should be working. So, where do I aim? Just here. Here. Yes. Oh. <laughs> now try it. See? Oh. That just what the so I I I will do it for okay. you. <laughs> just say the word. Okay. See. Okay. All right. I think you're good. You okay. can introduce yourself. I will. Okay. All right. If everybody's ready, we'll get started. Um, I will do an introduction here in just a minute, but I got a couple of things to go over first. If you want to hit the next slide. When Kim asked me to do this, uh, he didn't tell me it was 90 minutes. And uh, the I did tell him that, it was no, 90 he, minutes. He may have, but I may not have read that far into the into <laughs> what he gave me. So uh, whatever I read is what is gospel to me. So um, I have about 60 minutes in here. So what I wanted to make sure that everyone understood, if you, if you have anything you'd like to ask, jump in. So, uh, and remember, we're going to test the theory that there's no dumb questions. So I'd like you to fix that for me so that there are some. Now, who cuts your hair? Cheech and Chong already used that, you know, so don't be, don't be utilizing those kind of things today. And then I have a saying about teachers, there's nothing like a good teacher. And if you want to hit that. I'm hitting it. I'm hitting it. All right. All right. And I'm nothing like a good teacher. So we're just going to have a lot of fun where you're going to talk about some things that we need to talk about. And then I'd like you to uh, jump in at any time that you'd like to. So um, I was asked to go over EMS financing and the things that we would do uh, outside of uh, uh, normal, I guess, if you would. But uh, so if you want to hit the next one. That one. Okay. So what you're going to learn today from me is a little bit of history in Colorado, where we were and where and how we got to today and uh, um, kind of blend the two together to try to show you uh, the different means or different types of financing that go on within the state of Colorado, give you an idea of what might or might not work for you. If you want to, um, and uh, contrary to Sean's last deal, there will be no math. <laughs> Unless you guys want to do it, because I sure tell you. Okay. <laughs> little history from me, uh, uh, and <laughs> Sean gave you his history. So I thought I'd add a little bit of uh, stuff here. So I started in a funeral home ambulance service. And those of you and that looked around the room, most of you are way too young to understand the value of that. So it's 1973. Um, and there were still a lot of funeral homes that ran ambulance services in the state of Colorado, as well as across the United States. And so my last question real quick, does anybody know, because I know in the back of your mind, you're going this really, that really isn't the way to go. Does anybody know why the funeral homes were so prevalent in EMS across the United States? Poor, poor care, poor outcomes. No, why they were in it. <laughs> they had the right vehicle, but there's one other reason. So they could get the business from the we'll get into that in a minute. 
in the 50s and 60s, no one else answered their phone at night. So if you talk to the morticians, the ones that were there then, they honestly didn't want to be in the business. It was kind of given to them. So as the 70s grew, they moved them out. And then the state of Colorado decided to uh, put some regulations on ambulances and make uh, some rules and actually licensed ambulances. In 1973, when I got on an ambulance, and I'll tell you this little story here because it's going to come up here in a minute. As a pre-16 year old, I used to dig graves at the cemetery. I know that probably doesn't fit into most of you guys' stuff, probably paper boys or whatever, but it taught me how to drive things. Anyway, when I got my license to drive, I was told that my new address for work would be downtown. And because downtown had some vehicles and they were ambulances, and you just got thrown on ambulance. There was nothing in it. There was an oxygen bottle in the car. And for those of you that go way back, and a couple of you may remember lifting people from the ground up, kicking the cot down with one leg. Yeah, see? Okay, there's a couple of people here that really understand EMS. <laughs> anyway, in the process, I felt like that, that as I was into the funeral home business, if you will, uh, and I graduated from high school finally, I think graduation from high school for me was, let's see how fast we can get him out of here. Um, I asked if I could buy the ambulance service from the mortician because I did not think that the two of them were, were fit. No. He said, yes. And he gave me this outrageous price. And I said, my God, I could probably buy new stuff and for half the price and maybe do better. His answer to me was, I dare you. I'm not sure you're gone in six months. So I sold everything I had, including my class ring, which I like to tell this story. Gold was high and I hated high school. My parents bought it for me. I didn't buy it. <laughs> 15 years later, he was gone. I was the only one left. And um, um, I did sell out to a corporation who became a corporation who became AMR. So, and for seven years, I did run the uh, ambulance for uh, Pueblo Canyon City for AMR. And that's where I met uh, people like Tom and uh, Brandon um, during that process. Mm -hmm. And in the middle of that, I did have one stint for a year with a hospital-based ambulance. Um, and then I moved on to, uh, uh, I went up to Loveland in, in the year 2000, became the uh, Division Chief of Operations for Thompson Valley EMS which is a title 32 special district and eventually became the chief of that operation in 2006. So I wanted to give you that background so you can understand that all of the things that I'm gonna tell you now, I think will blend into the different operations which uh, across the state of Colorado actually do today. And it'll give you some idea of, of where we came from, from before. And to give you a little idea of where we are right now in uh, Northern Colorado, uh, Thompson Valley has, uh, and let me preface this with, I have to fix my bio because what Tim got from my bio was an old one. And there's a lot of things in there. Tim called me and asked me about the college I went to that doesn't even exist anymore. And I had to kind of give it to him. I, I did get my bachelor's degree years ago. I just have not updated my bio. And we do have six stations. We do run also a uh, CARES program. We have our own dispatch center. And we, uh, um, we also have uh, mental health vans to reduce stress on our system because our latest customer base is switching to that. You may be seeing the same thing and it's kind of killing the system for us. So we're, we're approaching that just a little bit differently, but I wanted to let you know where we we're from. So um, also uh, one other thing about from, from my standpoint, I've been on a few uh, a few things in the state of Colorado over the years, and I currently sit on the Homeland Security Senior Advisory Committee, and I've been on that for EMS for quite a while, and I'm going to drop that this year. So if there's any EMS people who want to get in that, you need to get with Scott Schultz from the MSAC and uh, toss out your name because uh, we really need a representation uh, on that board from the EMS side of things. Everybody else has pretty good representation. All right. 
this is the old time 70s version. Um, I was looking around the state. So we had the funeral homes and uh, we had a gas station in Pueblo. Uh, the Hurleys ran the EMS for a while. In case you're wondering, if you ever wanted to see the newest, greatest Cadillacs, Mr. Hurley had them. So that was a kind of a cool, uh, cool environment. There's quite a few volunteer ambulance groups around the state of Colorado that were just put together. I know in one community, the Rotary Club actually uh, threw some things together to have an ambulance in some areas. So some of the rural communities had quite a few uh, littler things. There was a church that ran EMS for a while. Um, and then of course the fire departments um, there was a lot of volunteer fire departments and, uh, and in, in the bigger cities, I think, uh, you know, like the Denver metro area, there were some privates and uh, um, uh, Denver Health ran EMS. And as you can see, the funding here, <clears throat> and I want to preface some of this right now, this, uh, somebody talked about the almighty body when we were talking about funeral homes, that's going to come up again in today's environment. So remember that. There was that piece of the funeral home where they're, they were getting, basically, as Sean was talking earlier, they're basically funding the ambulance through a downstream piece, which was in, in the days of, uh, in the 70s, an uh, ambulance call from this funeral home was $25. The funeral averaged 2000 So when you look at the, it's like, and we'll get to it a little later, there's still some of that going on today, not funeral home-wise. But the Almighty Body brought them that that downstream price. Um, the gas station, I think, was based off of downstream stuff or recognition in the community to get people to come in there. Uh, the volunteer groups, of course, were mostly um, just public working for the public, or as uh, I think uh, some of them said, friends helping friends. The church is, uh, I guess, a get into heaven card. I don't know. I, I brought that up the other day and got slapped around because of it, but. Uh, I'm thinking that's probably what they were doing. And of course, the fire departments had some form of a tax, uh, and a lot of them in the early 70s were volunteer, not paid departments. So um, it was something that they could do, but they weren't being abused like today. So to go in to do a volunteer deal, you can, uh, you can expect that it was kind of a fun deal to do. In today's environment, it's a little bit harder. All right, we'll go to the next one. And I've got several of these for today's world. So um, we do have the private ambulances. And from uh, I want you to understand from my background, I've seen them all and I don't have an affection any one way or the other. So I want you to understand that if I say something and offend somebody, jump up and let me know that I should uh, change the way I talk. Um, the privates basically are a fee for service and maybe in some cities, and I do know some cities that have somewhat of a subsidy or some form of a payment to help the ambulance service that if it doesn't have the volume it needs. And the nonprofits are the same thing. So you, you, your, your fee for service and, and your subsidies in order to make things work in that regard. Subsidy in that regard is, I don't know, if you're in a city, the city may give you a certain amount of money just to kind of be there. Now there's some reverse of that coming up later, but um, city and county are third service type situations, which are the ambulance not connected to a fire department um, are a fee for service and tax support. Of course, fire service and there. I think there's a bit of fire service in the room. So same thing. Uh, and I, I hope you all charge something. I know Sean was discussing whether you charge, whether you don't charge. I, I don't think it's a fair assessment unless you're very, very little, when there is no charge for the service because then everybody's paying for somebody else's situation. So um, now, on the other hand is, and I don't know, Tim may be gone by now, but uh, um, I'm also not for getting way up there in the price range either. I used to have a place in Cripple Creek. I, I used to have a place there in Cripple Creek and I had to drive through Woodland Park. So I had to sell it because I'm afraid of getting in an accident because I'm not a resident. I have to pay that outrageous price. <laughs> Just look and see if he's in. All right. And then the Title 32 Special Districts, which is what I operate in now, um, you know, operates the same as, say, a fire district, a library district, or any of that nature. So we do have a mill levy. So we get tax support and we do have a fee for service. Okay, now is where we get back to the almighty body. 
I've been watching this. Now there's some hospital districts or hospitals um, that have ambulance services and they're single like Gunnison is covering their city. Up north, we have a couple of hospital systems that have ambulances. And I've been watching this and I got to tell you, the difference between now and 1973, at the end of the day, the morticians actually respected each other. <laughs> what I'm seeing now is some, some crazy stuff going on. They're taking each other's territories. They're, they're doing this, they're doing that. Um, and I'm just sitting back wondering, is that really EMS? <laughs> or is this all downstream almighty body? But anyway, think about that when you look at those kind of things, because it's, they're going to make a lot more money on uh, downstream, I don't know, surgeries, uh, lock it in. So anyway, up north, it's that way when you get your other ones. And I will tell you that up north, and the reason that we have a special district is 1907 or 1998, I guess it was, the Bruce Amendment came in. Those of you in the taxing world know the Bruce Amendment, which limited taxing authorities to make a step higher than whatever that percentage was that the Bruce Amendment had out there. And Fort Collins, Loveland area, both of those hospitals were hospital districts, but they couldn't compete in that world, keeping their budget underneath this percentage point. So both of them got out of the hospital districts and in Fort Collins, they kept the ambulance in the hospital and in Loveland, they spun it off into a Title 32 special district called the Health Services District. And that's why there's a difference there now. And in Greeley, the same thing went on as Fort Collins. So, uh, that's their type of funding in the hospitals. There's other sources of funding, which, uh, did you go? Yeah. Okay. Um, these are the lower level fundings. I see them and we got a couple of uh, little fire districts in the west end of our area that will have their bake sales. One of them has an art sale every year and I was shocked at how much money they make. So uh, there are ways of putting these things in, but these are um, the, the, the programs that will not sustain an organization, but are not bad to have. Um, I heard of something last night that might also be put in there. Something about selling disaster trailers and then buying them back. <laughs> see, who in the, see who in the room last. Um, anyway. We want to move on to the next one. <laughs> the grants and the foundations, those kind of things are, um, and I think Randy Kirkendall puts this the best way when it comes to the grant programs in Colorado. Um, they're more for widgets. They're more for capital items. They're more for things that are not going to continually uh, uh, cost you money. So uh, uh, those kind of things will not support an annual budget but they will buy things. They will, they will reduce the other side of your budget. And by the way, and we got a Zoll represented in, in here. Um, this was when Zoll was cool, they had a dog. <laughs> I'd bring that up. All right, next. Who is Zoll? Huh? They said who is Zoll? No, I'm not familiar with Zoll. It's um, a uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> All right. He was joking, I think. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> or get a dog. <laughs> I don't remember how long ago it was they had the dog, but uh, I was in Las Vegas and they brought him in and uh, that was probably the most well-groomed dog I ever saw in my life. And uh, he, he was quite the, quite the deal. It's quite the, uh, the program. And then the subscription programs. And I think uh, Sean went over a little of that with you. And I was investigating some of those over the, the last week. And there are a ton of rules out there for your subscription programs in order to make them viable. But they can be. But as I looked at these, I wonder how a small organization can afford to even put one of these together with all the rules and all the lawyers it's going to take to make it work so that you're not violating any of these laws that come up and especially the anti-kickback laws from Medicare. Um, and one of the things that was in there, you know, it has to be a program that 
they can look at and say is real viable. So in other words, you got to make more money on what you're bringing in than what you've lost or the program doesn't become viable for the federal government. So uh, there's different varieties of it. I think Tim was saying that he, uh, he doesn't charge the folks that pay taxes in his, in his area. That's kind of a subscription program, if you will. You could twist it any way you want. We used to do that years ago, but it got into some legal uh, things that just didn't work out for us. So we, we dropped that program, but it is good if you can make it work because it certainly makes your, your folks in your community happy. So um, if, uh, if you're looking at something like this, and this is a way of bringing in some money, depending on how many people in the community would support it, um, there's a good article from Fitch and Associates on this, which really drills it down. So if you're interested, uh, that group uh, has a lot of information on how to put one of these together. But there's quite a bit of money can be made in one of these, all right? Then of course there's the mill levies that everybody in the special districts, cities, counties, and everyone has. And that's basically where you're getting charged uh, for uh, whatever your assessed valuation on your property is. And uh, so these are really, mill levies are great, especially if you have commercial uh, because they're, they're assessed differently and you, you bring in a lot more money that way. But, and these are pretty steady, they don't vary. So as time goes on, every two years, they do a reassessment. And so, of course, your, your, your valuation changes a bit. But uh, so the mill levy is pretty uh, standard uh, across the board on any taxing authority. Most of you have that. And most of you probably understand how that works. Okay. And then, of course, you have your fee for service, which I hope everyone does now. I stepped out of the room a couple of times. I don't know if Sean talked about that, but the last from the national average was about 43% collection rate. What do you what do you think, Sean? Yeah, I didn't have any national numbers in my in my talk. I think that that's that's probably about right because your low end is probably in the 30s, 40s in the big urban areas, which are probably most of the numbers. And you know, the anomalies are you and me and you know. Suburban wealthy enclaves, which are probably a little higher. Yeah. <laughs> well, but smaller numbers overall. Yeah. So if you're looking at 40%, it is hard to sustain a service with just a fee for service unless the volume's there. So, uh, um, for instance, the AMR side of things, I mean, they can balance theirs. And I hope I don't step on anything, but because I used to do this over there, you know, the the, the Pueblo arrangement could help the, the Canyon City arrangement stay viable. But nowadays from listening to Tom, the Canyon City arrangement has come up to the point where it sustains itself. But I think that's how you, you work things. And then they've got Colorado Springs Pueblo, you, you add all of them together, those kind of things then create a, 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 a budget that you can work with. So, but we're not gonna gain better than about 40% except under the new arrangement with Medicaid. Uh, as we grow into that, the rest are not going to be paying much more than that. So if you do have a tax dollars coming in, the goal would be to make up the 60% so that you're at 100%, basically. You can budget off of that, all right? I will say, though, that in my opinion, um, EMS is a public utility and should be treated that way. So some communities do have to stand up and take care of the folks and make sure that it works. I know that does not <laughs> happen everywhere. And, and I've got to go out to a few of them for the state when they do the reviews. And uh, Kim's asked me a time. Uh, and uh, so I've done three or four of those. And when we go out there to look at these areas that are kind of on the rocks or, or having some failures in their system, it starts with money and crumbles from there. They're all the same. It's, you know, and, and what we do when we go out to do those is try to find a way to you know, band-aid their system until they can, they can figure their own way through it. And uh, it's, it's all about money. And that's why I think that it should be a public utility. So next is our sales tax, which special districts can do that now, but it takes a vote of the people to, to put that in place. 
And of course the cities and the counties have been doing it for years uh, and it works really well in good economies. And, uh, uh, but I've seen it, you know, what was it, 2008 when the economy tanked, um, some of the fire departments that were getting some, uh, were really living on sales tax really took a bite. So that one can fluctuate, whereas the mill levy stays the same basically across the board. So anyway, that's a, that's one that kind of, you just kind of want to ride, okay? And then we have bonds and I think uh, uh, Sean went over the bonds pretty good. Um, bond issue though, has got to be voted on. For instance, Sean's recent one that he lied to the general public to get what he got. Uh, that's a lot of money, Sean. Anyway. Um, <clears throat> And then we have the other side, which is the COPs, which don't take a vote of the people, but you still have to budget it in your budget. So it's almost like a lease. What happens is they sell the bonds at whatever. So I did this a few years ago. So $3 million is what they went out and sold. And basically what happens is whatever you're using the money for, and we did for a building, becomes part of the, the company that sold the bonds. So you're basically leasing your building back from until your bonds are paid down. So what's the COP? Certificate of participation. I can't think of what comes after that, but I think it's just bond. Anyway, uh, I'm refinancing those. They had a 10 year call on them. And so we were refinancing them. That's pain, but it'll save them a million dollars over the next 10 years by, you know, reducing that amount of, uh, of, uh, interest rate that you pay on those. But that did not take a vote of the general public to do. But you have to remember, your budget has to absorb it. So whatever that is, you do get the $3 million, $10 million, whatever it is, but you're gonna have to pay that back each month. So we just felt like we didn't wanna spend our capital money down and that's why we did it. So I don't know. So there's, uh, that's a way, but again, this is another way when you put your budgets together, of buying things, this is not gonna sustain anything unless you get one, uh, you know, and the, that'd just be a mill levy increase if you're looking for one for salaries because that would have to continue on. So, and all of these will have a sunset on them or should have a sunset on them. So is yours 20 years? Uh, it'll probably be 25 as I was telling Eric. Yeah, and a certificate of participation is just essentially, it's the non-bond version of a bond just like a lease purchase is a non, it's a allowable approach to uh, using operating money to buy something and not meeting other people. Okay, next. What I'm gonna try to get you to understand today. Now, if you look at this, this is actually my service today. And this is probably me in 73. I don't know. I found the picture on the news. Uh, no, not really. But I've been in both of these. <laughs> what does your community think you are? I've had people, yeah, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> I hadn't thought of that one. But yeah, um, I've had people ask, and I think uh, Brandon remembers some of these in the, in the Pueblo days. Does somebody ride in the back with us? You know, the general public has to be informed of what you're doing and where you're going. Your budget, and this is the part I'm gonna to try to get through today, financing EMS is only as good as the community is gonna allow you to do. It doesn't matter who you are, even Tom. The fee for service is only going to, the size of the community is gonna demand what you get to do. And whatever the community allows you to take the next step. So, You've got, to, you've got to prove to the community what you are. Do you want to go on to the next one? And then one more. So really, what have you done for your community lately? Now, I had a conversation with an EMS group, and I won't say who, just recently that was, there was some, a lot of stuff going on, and the individual asked me, well, you guys do a CARES program up north and you're doing your mental health and how do you get reimbursed for it? My answer was we don't, but 
It's stopping me from adding an ambulance, which costs me a million dollars a year. So if it costs me $250,000 to run a program and I'm saving a million, I've actually gained $750,000. Now they weren't computing all of this stuff. So I said, maybe if you did something like this, it'll get you into heaven. And the individual told me, and I'll quote, well, you know what, Randy, I don't believe in heaven, so I'm going to get out of this one. So I just stalled there and I was thinking, we won't get anywhere with that attitude. They have to understand what we do. They have to, I don't know. We got to stop pushing this hero status and start embedding ourselves in the community so that the community feels that EMS is that public utility that they want to pay for. And just billing for service isn't going to work anymore. It's going to be a part. It's not going to be the end all. Um, one other, I want to give you two examples. And these may be good, these may not be good, but Penrose, Colorado, I think he's, everyone saw in the news a few months back, they just chose to stop responding to EMS calls. Now, I'm gonna do a little preaching here because I think that's wrong. I think that's totally out of line. And they pushed on their community. Well, if you don't go for this 10 mil increase, that's what it's gonna be. I will mention one name. AMR stepped up to the plate out of Canyon City and was and added some, some uh, ambulance time to try to make sure that the people in Penrose didn't lose out. I was having coffee with one of the board members from the fire department and that ex-board member, I better clarify this. He said to me, well, that makes me mad because if people don't suffer, they're not gonna vote for this. So in case you're wondering, I didn't buy his copy. <laughs> That's wrong, but they got their millet. Now you go up to Craig, Colorado. Anybody in here from Craig? Their hospital was really struggling to get this amb these ambulances out and they were doing it the right way. They didn't stop. They lost their bond issue. I still think we have to do it that way. I disagree totally with making the public suffer at all. And the guys in Pinneros know this, so it isn't like I haven't, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm speaking out of school, but I think that was the wrong way to go. So next one. So really, this is true. If you do wanna be the hero, you should be more concerned with others than yourself. And this, uh, and before you go to the next one, I got to set this up. This is, uh, I don't know, some of you old guys have probably seen uh, Bringing Out the Dead. Okay, I'm liking you more and more back there in the back of the room. You, you're, you're on, you're on board with me. This is cool. Um, Nicholas Cage, and this one, my IT guys put this together, so a little bit of it was cut off. So I kind of, kind of got to let you know. Um, he was discussing. The old adage, I'm getting in this to help people. So here you go. So there you go. Sometimes things will be good if you're giving back to the community. So how robust will your community allow you to be? One of the things that I have learned over the years, and I, I think uh, a doctor in Pueblo taught me this, and it wasn't Dr. Weber, so I won't embarrass him right now, but I think Brandon will know who he was, said that your survival rate is 100% better if you come in with EMTs than if you come in with paramedics. Uh, I don't know if he's right or wrong, but occasionally um, I think he might've had hit the nail on the head. Don't overdo it. 
set your sights on what your community is going to let you do. If it's BLS, it's BLS. It's better than the Penrose model of not responding, I think. So set your sights on where you need to be. And you can grow from there as you get into the community and see what the community is going to, going to do for you. But the cost of ALS is more. Um, we've looked at the models two or three times. I was out in Nashville pre-COVID and we were discussing the, what was called a paramedic shortage. And I don't think there is one. I think there's an allocation of paramedic. There's a problem with how you allocate paramedics. You don't need two paramedics on an ambulance. You don't need 14 paramedics on a fire truck. You put them in the right place and you don't have that problem. And in some areas have the BLS where a paramedic can come out if it's not necessary they can move on to the next call and if that's what you can afford. We're, we're kind of playing with a model like that up north just to see if in fact that would work. So do, do you need 12 paramedics or do you need six? How many of your calls are actually needing a paramedic on them? Build your, build your system that way so that your system can be, a, can be built according to the money that the community will send your way. Right. So here's your high level, which is your 12 leads. You're doing all your ALS. That's the kind of stuff you want to do. And your next one. Now, I only threw the Life Pack 5 in there for you guys that actually used one. I know Ted did. Um, <laughs> and I did. Um, this did not diagnose anything for us. But you could, you could put the patches on somebody's head, tell them it was a lie detector test, and turn the gain up and it burned through the paper. <laughs> I know none of you, and I, I never did that, but I saw some folks. Do that. <laughs> so this kind of your BLS level is what I was trying to do. I just, I really screwed the picture up. But anyway, so then you can go on to the next one. Now this, this level is what Brandon Chambers tried one year, um, which is, uh, so if you go to the next one, you'll see what happens. Um, what's that? Applying your diode. Get that wash back. So I think what I want to show you with these slides is you don't want to go too low. This, I think, is that Penrose model. Whereas the next step up would have been a better idea. Even if it wasn't robust, work with what you got. Hang on just a second before you go. Let me see what we got next. Okay, now the next one is as low as you're going to get. tell you people times are tough. You read the papers, the country's going to hell. Now you take inflation, recession, welfare, there's nothing we can do about that. But thanks to muggings, malnutrition, assassination and disease, we got a chance to make a buck. <laughs> we all know where that came from. Mm -hmm. If you don't, if you don't, you should watch the movie. Uh, that, it did come out in the late in the late seventies, and some of that stuff actually was going on if you were around. What's that? Well, that's true too. But uh, times have changed. It is much nicer now. now. In my opinion, now that if you have a realistic idea of what your EMS system should be then you, you figure out your funding that you currently have, and then you figure out the difference between the two and where you're gonna go from there. That's where you gotta get back into the community and the community has to accept what you're looking for so that they can, well, I guess for lack of a better word, bail you out from the other side. Next. So, I really do think you have to get into the community and you have to get deep into the community. And remember, your critics are the people you really need to attach yourself to so you can understand what it is that's going to get, be the hurdles in your way to make your next step in this. We, uh, up north, we hired a PR person uh, last year for six-year lead-in time for what we believe is going to be a mill levy increase. 
So that's how far out you got to go, or at least from my opinion. So make sure that your, your lead in time gives you the opportunity to at least have one failure, if you will, of um, a mill levy increase so that the second time you know what your, your issues were and you can uh, hopefully beat it the following time. Also, as you get into these things and you get in the community, you can find out who else is coming up for mill levy increases or uh, other increases that would get in the way because I don't know about you guys, but whenever there's a ton of uh, tax increases on your ballot, you probably just mark no because you don't want to pay for all of them. If there's one, you might read it. If there's two, you might read it. But other than that, you wouldn't. So I think that you've got to be careful about that. Um, but so anyway. So how much information does the community want to hear? And you need to be careful about what you give them. But the one thing that I think you have, you do have to be consistent, but the one thing that I've seen and I, I, I really don't appreciate is I, I think it does have to be honest. Now, don't twist the truth. Just be honest with what you're delivering. Um, they don't need gory details. They don't need, let me give you an example of how I've worked over the years. Remember that cemetery thing I talked to you about? I told you about the cemetery for a reason. We used to mow the lawn at the cemetery and we used to trade the grass to the farmer next door for his horse crap for fertilizer, okay? Now you have to sift the crap to get fine fertilizer. Because if you put big crap on your lawn, it kills it. If you put fine crap on your lawn, it grows it to the point where you gotta mow it twice a week. I know, I had to mow. Remember, <clears throat> only fine crap. Don't overload it, it will fall apart on you. Think about that. And you'll remember me with that one. <laughs> now, All right, next one. Some of you may remember this. Is that true? Nobody. What's true? Well, there's two kinds of people. Them going somewhere and them going somewhere. And that's what's true. I don't agree, Ben. That's because you don't know what the hell I was talking about. Make sure that's from Paint Your Wagon, which was a really cool show if you're old. Um, be the people going somewhere, but make sure that the public knows what the hell you're talking about. And not from a standpoint, again, I guess I can't emphasize enough the fact that scaring people into voting isn't the right way to go and scaring people into making it your ideas of the right way to go. It's gonna come back and haunt you. Being honest will be a good foundation for where you're taking your agency for the next years to come. And they'll remember that as you go through it. Um, all right, next. So it is all on you. And it's how hard you or your organization really wants to work to pull this thing up and to get it through whatever it is that you're gonna make it happen in your community. Remember, it's your community, not you, that's gonna make the decisions for you. Told you I only had about 60 minutes, but okay. <laughs> All right, this is my belief. EMS is like a religion. You do have to grow it. There is no big bang theory where it's just gonna happen for you. It's not. At least I haven't found any yet. You'd think I was going to be a preacher, didn't you, huh, Sean? All right. And the last part to wind it up here. Again, I guess I can't tell you more than I've already told you. It's still, in my opinion, community-based stuff, not 
it's it's out of your hands if you don't if you don't build them into your program. It's completely out of your hands. There's no funding for folks that don't bring the community into what they're doing. So that's what I have for you. Does uh, is there anything anybody? I haven't heard any dumb questions yet, so I'd really like to hear one. <laughs> I showed you some dumb videos. You could at least. So how, uh, Randy, how do you move a low volume service into, I mean, by low volume, I'm saying under 400. And I realize Sean's got 400, but he's also got a big tax and whatnot. Under 400 calls, how do you move that volunteer type service into a sustainable model? Well, I think, in my opinion, it has to start Repeat with- Repeat for those online. Okay. What's that? Repeat for those online. Oh, how to move a low volume agency into a sustainable agency. Uh, I think if you go back to, don't overdo it. Don't look for that ALS piece. Look for your BLS piece and build into it. You got to have neighbors. Most of the time, I know uh, in Southern Colorado, AMR will go out and meet with some of the BLS agencies that are running in the little areas out there, especially west of Canyon City, um, if they run into those kind of programs. So their, their programs are based on BLS and they are able to sustain it that way. Now, some of them are struggling, I know that, um, with trying to get help. That I... I don't know, I think it's everybody's problem right now. Where do you where do you find the help? But most of the rural areas, your help is homegrown. It's folks that don't wanna leave. It's folks that are gonna be there. That's where you you build those into those. Um, the, uh, what is this? EMR, I believe it is, is what they, the state calls it now, which I think, and you'd have to check into this, you can have on an ambulance now, such as a driver, driver. okay? So if you have to get to that, so you've got an EMR, which is the old advanced first aid class, I think is what it is. Yeah, yeah. And, and so you could have two or three more of those kind of folks, and then you can have your, your EMTs that are available and less of them. I, I think that's the only way you can make that happen. And you can share. Now, there was a group down in gosh, the Alamosa area, Monta Vista, when we were doing some uh, reviews that we're struggling to keep everybody together, especially when it came to moving folks out of town. So they, they all got together and made certain days of the week that one agency would do it in certain days of the week when the others would. And that they were able to sustain their people that way. So they knew that on Monday and Tuesday, we're going to be needing to beef up where the others are not. And that seemed to work for them. Now down in uh, Bent County, when we did that review, you know the ambulance is is separate from the uh, from the uh, fire department, but the fire department collects the tax and puts it together, and again actually gives them their money. And that kind of a model, I thought, worked well. So they were able to use the fire department to get their mill levy but the fire department was honest and gave them their money and actually split the district uh, uh, when it came to who was running what. And I think that that kind of a model works too. So I, I, uh, I don't know. I'd like to say volunteers, if you can get them, but I don't know if you can get them anymore, especially with the amount of uh, training that you have to do. But I think the EMR is gonna help. Um, we're, we're using EMRs or we're gonna use EMRs. Right now we use EMTs on our mental health van, but it seems to me that you could use an EMR in that regard too. Um, and, and that's what we're doing to reduce the stress on our system, which is, which is that mental health. But the smaller areas can't do that. I don't think. I don't think there's enough volume for you to have more than uh, just an ambulance to, to handle those kind of things. But uh, that's the only thing I can think of. But you know, years ago in Pueblo, we got to, uh, because of the uh, chemical stockpile, we got to sit with the folks from Northern Ireland back in the day when uh, the terrorists were in Northern Ireland and not somewhere else. <laughs> and the fire department there went over how they handled those kind of things. And 
their system is built in Northern Ireland, their fire system is built like the National Guard. It's not locate. It's not isolated to cities. It's a you know. It's a it's a national thing, and uh, um, so for instance, if you were out in I don't know Ray, Colorado, you're a national guardman. You might be you might be sitting in Ray, but you're all getting you're all trained the same, and you you move around and do the same kind of thing. Maybe one day the state's going to have to get to the point where we have some form of subsidy that helps these little communities where we can move people out there for a certain amount of time at a time to make sure that they've got their coverage. And that's where, I hate to say this for two of you in the room, but that's where the retex come in. I wouldn't mind helping people out east of our community with a paramedic now and then when they needed it or on a regular basis if they needed it. But I think that's where you gotta start looking at how can, how can we pay for it? You've got a question. Prior to the Bruce Amendment, yes. <laughs> now I so make sure they know you're okay. answering that. Okay, yeah, I'm answering a question. Uh, have you ever heard of, of a hospital ran EMS agency getting subsidies from the city and county in which they provide services? Um, and I think we still do have a couple of uh, smaller hospitals that are, that are Title 32 special districts, and they do get money from them. Now, I don't know of any that the city is pumping money into or that the county would be pumping money into, but uh, if they're uh, under the special district uh, rules, they, could, they can uh, get a mill levy amount for that. But I don't know of any that are. I don't, Sean, if, I don't think the one in Gunnison does that. I think the hospital just handles it. They do part. Part A bill too, a lot of that. Well, that's true. That's true. That's so, like so you're, yeah. There's your downstream funding, though. Right. So you got to wonder why they do it, because you're uh, the way I understand Medicare, and I'm not a hospital guy, believe me. And as a matter of fact, I like to stay out of hospitals. Um, they'll get an amount for a patient that comes in, whatever that is. So if they're there ten days or they're there two days, that amount is that amount. Jump in, anybody who understands this better than me. So if they're bringing their own patient in, that amount, if I bring it in to some hospital, they get that amount and they don't have to pay for the ambulance. But if they bring it in, they're paying for the ambulance too. So I've never understood how that always balanced out for them under that program. Now, not everybody gets admitted to a hospital. So the part A piece is a whole different thing, but that is true. So, so there's another question. How do you deal with a board that is against subsidy when the service is growing rapidly and revenue does not support sustainability as an enterprise. Well, we have elections every so many years. And uh, I would push for somebody <laughs> new to be on a board that's against subsidy. Are you talking about your own board? Or are you I'm, talking about- no, I'm, I'm reading this, This yeah. I, I think Travis is from Morgan County, if I recall. Mm -hmm. And I think the I think you could, this question could be brought oh, okay. forward. Well, if, if, you're from, if, if Travis is from Morgan County, then the county runs the ambulance. Um, so I don't understand his uh, his. Uh... Well, I think what he's saying, and I think Cheyenne County back here would agree, the both are run by the commissioners, but the, they are not willing to financially support the growth of that agency. Okay. So how do you deal with that? My community involvement. My yeah, that goes back to community involvement. But are you guys from Cheyenne County? So you got some commissioners that are kind of. You need to you need to work on. Um, <laughs> you know, I had to do this a few years ago in in uh, Larimer County, but I think that you have to start getting into the to the commissioner's head. So part of what we've been doing is getting them in to ride. Now I. I know in a smaller community, riding is a whole different idea than say, you know, I can put them on an ambulance in our system that's, that's going out 65 times a day. They're going to see something that triggers something for them. But if you're in a community that doesn't so much, um, I think that's one way. But there's another way, too. And we found this years ago. We had one of the um, folks in the community that went into cardiac arrest and we were able to get him back. 
and he was somebody that we could promote. And uh, he did a whole lot of promoting for us. Now, that was just an accident that we were able to utilize that kind of stuff. But you have to have some people in the community that you yourself can say we've done some good for that would step up to the plate for you. And the more they see that, the more they see that in an election for them. <clears throat> but I think you're, I wouldn't want to be, and I meet with the commissioners in Fremont County all the time. And I keep telling them this Penrose thing is wrong. <laughs> and they just keep staring at me like I'm wrong. <clears throat> I wouldn't want to have a community that I was trying to sell to somebody that didn't have an EMS or a good EMS response, or at least a fair EMS response. I had a question, and this happens in two other states, but uh, it seems like when I talk call volume with some agencies, they, they know it right away. Some don't because they they get confused with the amount of like wheelchair van trips mm -hmm. and that that uh, the income from the wheelchair vans, you know, obviously isn't reimbursed by like Medicare or Medicaid. So their community involvement is tied directly to that wheelchair van because they just have so many thousands and thousands of trips in the community. How do you, how do you take that? Like, what's the future of that? The wheelchair vans? Yeah, the wheelchair vans and like, like, especially with privates when that was, yeah. We have three of them out. We have one out a day, but it's it has a wheelchair lift on it, but it's mainly for the transportation of mental health. Now, we also have a mental health hospital. Not every community has a mental health hospital, so this isn't going to work for everybody, but we're working to be able to transport those people directly to this mental health hospital versus an ER where they sit for what? I don't know. Anybody know? Eight hours, 10 hours, 12 hours, until they find a bed and then they call our van and we got to run them to Pueblo, Colorado or, or some of that nature. So that's that's what our vans are doing. And then the wheelchair lift is there for a different reason. Um, we found that, and this is another way to get into your community, but we found that a lot of people are attached to a wheelchair now. And that wheelchair isn't what it used to be. It's like a thousand pounds. It's a it's part of their life. It's how they get around. We've had a lot of folks that will not go to the hospital because their wheelchair couldn't go with them. So we just ask our van to come out, pick up their wheelchair, so we can get them to the hospital, get them some help, and then the wheelchair comes behind them. We also use the van to do that with their dogs if that happens. So you know, because a lot of people are attached to a, a, an animal of some kind. Uh, uh, that is their their means of doing things when you do things like that you don't don't splash it out there but let that roll out to the community remember years ago no one knew ronald mcdonald had a house at every children's hospital across the united states it was quiet it was something they did to help these people and the only way you knew about it was somebody would tell you I knew about because I had friends that ended up in a Ronald McDonald house. That's going to gain you more than if you have the newspaper follow you around. But do have the newspaper follow you around in some in some avenues. Don't exploit people. Exploit your service. Don't exploit the people. There are people who will jump up and help you out. The guy that we saved on the cardiac arrest, his wife made him come in and do the things that he did. I don't know why, because you know, it depends on your wife. My wife might have thought, whoa, you guys shouldn't have done that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm not sure. But uh, uh, if you're not exploiting people, but you're exploiting your service, I think it'll go a long way. Um, but the commissioner thing, I think, is a tough one. How many commissioners you got? Three. Okay. They have the four by probably a small county. Mm -hmm. Small population, but large miles. Uh, our hospital is only trying to afford, so we do a lot of transfers for you know the city. But um, I'm the full, first, you know, there were smart, there were overthinkers enough. I'm the first full time guy they hired, so I'm the full time director as the person who's on. So we're doing, we're moving forward. You know, we had two EMT classes, we have 17 crew members now. Uh, so we're moving forward and 
the thing I understand about ALS, like for now and once, very little time do we need ALS, so very few ALS is key. For hospital transfers, there's times if we have an ALS patient that needs to go, they're either going to fly and they don't need to fly. Or wait three or four hours for an ALS provider to come out to us to take it. So we're trying to get ALS so we can do more transfers, but we also talk about our call right. Let me give you an example of what we're doing. We kind of repeat what he Oh yeah, for those talking about the uh, transfers right, out. Yeah, yeah, the uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Hell, I can't even remember names. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so basically, the the question is, what do you do for the out of town transfers when you need ALS? You don't have an ALS service. Well, let me tell you what. And it's a whole different world up north. We every ambulance we have has got a, a paramedic on it right now. But we don't have a CCT because we have 450 square miles that we cover, and that's all we care about. Everything else is outside what we call the Iron Curtain. One of the local hospitals was calling a CCT when, let's say you, you're in the cath lab and something goes wrong and you're going to need to go to another hospital for a cabbage. But it's, it's, it's occurring right now. They'd call a CCT and it'd be an hour or an hour and a half or two hours before that CCT arrives to take that patient out there. So what we showed them was, we have an ambulance on the campus. One of our stations happens to be on their campus. You call, we'll have them in the cath lab. Your nurse is stuck with that patient for that two hours anyway. You let the nurse go with us and we'll have her back before the CCT would have arrived. Well, they didn't believe it, but they tried it. And now that's all they do. So that nurse is stuck anyway. So the nurse just goes with us they actually have nurses now that volunteer to come in and cover for nurses if they're on this, if they're being transferred, but that came with time. So that's how we, uh, and that was just a step different than yours. It was an ALS, but it's not a CCT ALS. So there's certain drugs they can't handle, but, and the nurses have, have actually enjoyed, I think the process, they've been very good. And the cardiac docs, are so on board that, uh, I don't know, uh, we could certainly utilize them at any time for a bond issue if we needed to do it, so. So back to finish up Travis' question from Morgan County. He's explained that they're a county run, but they support themselves on revenue, except for 10%. Now the commissioners are not wanting to support that 10% subsidy. Yeah. So fix that for Travis, okay. would you? Okay. Travis, in our in our routine, uh, the the district board gives us sixty percent basically to cover for that hundred percent. I know what you're talking about, and and you're in my retech or our retech, so I understand fully what you're going through. But the again, the county commissioners, you're going to have to get in on, uh, um, and I think your fire department's volunteer, right? I'm pretty sure they are. So the county needs you. Um, yes. Uh, yes. So the county really needs you. And isn't it Cheyenne County? One of them, one of the counties out in your area has a hospital that is teetering. Is it yours? Oh, it could be any of them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, actually, Cheyenne County is doing pretty well because they passed a mill levy. Okay. But I've, I've heard of a few out there that, that, are in, that are on the verge of maybe closing. That then the community only has you. What are they going to do? And they need to understand that because if they only have you, how many people come into the ER a day? You're going to be taking half of those or more to a facility somewhere else. You're going to be out of town. So, um, you know, you are the backbone. Again, we're a public utility. We need to uh, we need to push that a little bit harder. And I don't think the current legislat legislation today or the, the people in the state house are on board with this, but with time, I think states got to start helping correct some of this stuff in the sense of what they consider EMS to be. And, uh, you know, if you look back from my stuff, from the funeral home days to today, I think we've come a long way, but we can't forget where we were. Toss that out to them. Because that's where we can go back to, uh, not funeral homes, because none of those guys will ever do it again. Um, but, uh, you know, I got a few friends that still do that. But I think uh, I, I, it, 
what I wanted to say uh, completely with this whole program was, honestly, it's not a, the money doesn't come without the people. The money doesn't come without, the, without your community, period. It really doesn't matter who you are. So, but please think twice before you threaten the community, even if you get your money by threatening the community. I just don't think that's the right way. I think it gives EMS a bad name across the state of Colorado and we don't need that. So, and those were not dumb questions. So, Brandon? You're asking him for the dumb questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, anything else? We're, we're, we're ahead of time here, folks, I think. Yes, we are. Yes. We're well ahead of time. There you go. Well, I got more than an hour out of that. Well, only because I kept pushing. Well, then you should do some more. <laughs> well. Any questions online? All right, seeing none, we will uh, resume at 2.45. All right, thank you. Sorry. Yeah, administration costs, maybe some training costs. Um, dispatch center. Yeah. Dispatch center. Employee relations, you know, the, the, the pizza for the, the 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 case reviews or whatever that you're doing or employee relations. What? <laughs> Children complaints. Yes. Which pays my salary at the moment. Yeah. So we're good. If you could also repeat stuff for those on the and catch me if I don't. Exactly. I know you did really good with Randy. I don't know what you got against me. <laughs> so uh, another thing though is discretionary versus non-discretionary expenses. And this is a really important guys for um, when you're trying to manage your budget. So um, and then Irregardless of whether this is a uh, transport revenue shortfall or a tax revenue shortfall or, uh, or what we're living today, which is uh, inflationary environment, um, you really need to know your, your mandatory or your discretionary versus non-discretionary expenses. So and that doesn't mean that something that's non-discretionary isn't important. You know, there's fallout that, uh, that many costs that are not absolutely mandatory for you to deploy a, a resource um, that, are, that are important, but, you, but if you need to develop a bridge plan, okay, so you figured out that you're going to have a shortfall. So you're either not going to get enough revenue in or you're not going to have sufficient um, uh, or you have too much inflation, right? So or your, your, your tax base is eroding for some reason. You have some sentinel event in your in your um, environment that is going to impact your your uh, your anticipated revenue from your taxes. You've got to build a, a bridge plan, so you really do need to understand your your uh, discretionary spending um, and uh, also other revenue opportunities. So, and uh, Randy did a really good job at showing some of those uh, you know shotgun approach to you know bake sales and. Um, you, you can actually do some pre-employment testing. I know AMR in, in Cheyenne, we were doing pre-employment drug testing. So we, we tried to bring as much revenue in as, as we possibly could um, to try and build those bridge plants when, that, when there's that revenue gap. Uh, so this one. And I, I know Tim's gonna go into this really heavy, um, but uh, reven uh, readiness, um, revenue versus um, cost, um, revenue. So if you run a call, right, uh, the payers, Medicare, Medicaid primarily, but the third party insurance companies as well are following suit, they only want to pay you for the direct cost for running that call. They don't want to pay for you to be ready. Okay. So, uh, and, and, and Tim's got a great spreadsheet on this, but, uh, but it, uh, we're just kind of teeing this up for the discussion later, but I wanted to talk about, um, be prepared to, to make your three minute elevator speech on this to your, to your elected officials and, and your folks that hold the purse strings. Because um, as this continues to erode uh, EMS systems, because revenue will continue to, to go down 
as um, payers can fall on this more and more. So you've got to find a revenue stream for that red, red readiness cost. So, you know, the, the days of fee for service, unless you're in a major metropolitan area, uh, are, are quickly coming to an end. So you've got to identify revenue sources, either through a, a tax stream uh, or doing some other revenue uh, efforts. Um, and even if you're a private company, don't be afraid to have that three minute elevator speech for those elected officials saying, you know, guys, we're going to have to start um, looking at some subsidy or it's going to degrade our service. You know, you can have three things in EMS. You can have faster, cheaper, or better. You can't have all three. Um, so. so I wanted just to kind of mention on some, some other things that you can use uh, some of this data for. So um, example is forecasting. So everybody knows AMR and their big services, they do demand analysis. And they have a pretty good idea that on a Friday night, they need to have nine ambulances on, and, you know, in order to be 90% compliant. Um, but, but take that kind of stuff and, and also model other things. So I used to take that same, those same spreadsheets and I would have model employee turnover based upon seasonality, right? So going into fall, I would know that as school wrapped up, I would know that I was going to lose 12 to 15% of my staff. So preemptively, I would hire um, for that. And uh, my, my supervisors would scream, oh, where are we going to put everybody? And then about two weeks later, they were saying, oh, my gosh, we're in trouble, right? So, we, you know, conservatively, we would hire preemptively and have people ready to go. So we didn't have that big shortfall of staff. Um, uh, surge capacity. So um, you... you uh, you want to look at seasonality. So not only do you want to do a demand analysis of your last 15 to 20 weeks of, um, uh, of your run rate, but if you're a seasonal system where you're in the ski slope or ski areas or some other area that, that has seasonality, you want to look at year over year, what, it, what, what percentage do I normally go up when you know, all the tourists hit or whenever we have the increase in our demand. So you want to use your run rate, but then you also want to factor in your your uh, seasonality uh, as well. So uh, for some, some opportunities for efficiency, um, if you're running a big system, you want to be able to use your non-transport personnel in a transport capacity. So, um, uh, you know, anybody in the office, your supervisors, you know, no, no one should be, be uh, unavailable to help with that surge capacity because you can't always predict that. Right? Um, and finally, I want to talk about a concept of, about patient charges, okay? So um, Medicare, Medicaid reimburses kind of what's usual and customary for a geographical area. So if you are not charging sufficiently, um, yeah, you may not get reimbursed right away for, for, for increased charges, but um, if you're not charging geographically all the, all the providers in an area sufficiently, then they won't pay, right? So in a micro area like uh, El Paso County, where AMR really keeps their, their charges pretty low, um, it impacts all the area fire districts because they can charge more, but Medicare Medicaid is gonna say, well, five miles down the road, AMR is paying 30% you know, yeah, less. So your reimbursement will be impacted. So again, that three minute elevator speech about, you know, we don't wanna gouge anybody. We don't wanna charge unfairly but we have readiness costs, we have uh, employees you know, turnover rates. I mean, everybody in here is probably um, experiencing turnover right now. Um, and we just have to do a better job of keeping our staff, keeping our staff happy, uh, providing pay benefits and uh, uh, retirement for these folks. So that's all driven by revenue. So, uh, so I, you know, I, I would say that we really are when compared to, and, I, and I, I, I'm the same ilk as Brandy, I believe we're a utility and we're, you know, you have three legs of the emergency services. You got EMS, fire, and PD. Um, and you can certainly have EMS under a fire department, but, um, but I don't think that we are sufficiently um, financed compared to PD and FD, right? So certainly when, not when you look at the call volume and the workload. I want to talk a little bit, and I touched on it already, um, 
is to make sure that you are planning for inflation over the next few years. So obviously we are seeing it now as you get ready to do your 2020 budget. If you haven't already, um, make sure that you are positioning yourself well for that and that you're really anticipating significant um, uh, increases in fuel and, and labor costs and things of that nature. So uh, please, please don't get yourself in a bind halfway through next year by not anticipating um, inflation. So going back to that communicate often with your elected officials and other policymakers, prepare your 60 second, okay, shortcut myself a little bit. Uh, prepare your elevator speech and, and hit it often, you know, and just because somebody doesn't receive you well the first time, go back and do it again and do it again and do it again. So, I mean, we are a very politically conservative community here and they are adverse to any kind of subsidy of the private sector, but you got to keep going back at it, keep hitting and keep asking. Uh, and, and when you make your ask, okay, so if you're going to go before your folks for a mill LV in increase and say that, you know, the numbers you think are going to be between three and four mils, man, go for the four mils, you know, uh, and, and uh, you know, it's, it's not going to go down. So if you're going to, if you, if you go before the vote of your people and you're going to ask for some money, make sure it's the, the right amount and that you finance yourself well. I, I just am I'm really uh, convinced that EMS in general is, is not well financed. So. So a little bit on the impact on EMS. So what, what, what happens if you um, have a reduce in your demand for service? Uh, obviously lower revenue, uh, even in the same geographical area, uh, you get less, you can get uh, uh, less cash per trip, right? So you are uh, uh, likely to receive less money. So that even goes back to your, your documentation for your caregivers. So, and then, uh, um, actually, uh, I'm kind of talking on your slide. Okay. Okay. So, so, and then uh, again, what I talked about with uh, CMS and uh, and uh, being able to to uh, pay for your system. So. Yeah. I think you're just for the fun of it, right? And this is not working. So. Good afternoon. My name is Tim Deanst. Um, helping Ted out and uh, part of the co presentate pre presenter on this portion of the classes. Um, once again, my name is Tim Deanst. I'm the Chief Executive Officer for Youth Pass Regional Health Services District up in Woodland Park, Colorado. Our district is about 540 square miles. Um, we cover portions of five counties. Um, we're in three separate retacks. Um, I serve five fire protection districts um, and a river runs through it, um, which is the Platte River. Um, also things that I do is, um, so I am the chair of the Plains to Peaks Retac, um, serve on SEMTAC, uh, part of the Public Policy and Finance Committee as part of SEMTAC. Um, also at the national level, um, I serve on a couple of key committees uh, with the National Association of EMTs. One is the Economics Committee. And what the Economics Committee is doing at the moment is looking at revenues and expenses and trends and um, potential financial threats to the EMS industry so that um, as we identify some of these things and issues, we can move them forward even to the advocacy committee to maybe try to get some improvements in EMS funding over the long run. Um, so when I was getting into my part of the presentation, it's interesting throughout the day, we've heard about UHUs, we've, used, we've heard about cost per transport, we've heard about all this stuff, but what does it really mean? And how do we really figure it? So unfortunately, my presentation has a little bit of math in it, um, but the good news is that that math has already been done. So I'm going to be talking about cost and revenue per transport, cost and revenue per unit hour, 
And we're going to talk about cost of readiness, how you figure that, what it means practically, and I'm going to give you a, an example of how I determine the rates for our service. Now, what's interesting about all these different um, topics that are on the screen, they're dynamic. So one of the things you're going to do is you're going to look at all of these factors when you're doing your budget, because um, you want to understand what your cost for transport is after you get your budget done so that you can help determine what your rate will be, what you will charge for the services that you provide, if there are any increases in the rates that you're going to charge or potentially any decreases in the rates you're going to charge. You also do that throughout the year, at least once a month. So you can compare what your current status is in your cost for transport to revenue for transport to what you originally budgeted um, for your service. Next, please. So the first one I am going to start off with, and this, these numbers actually come off my most recent October 31st um, financial statements. And so the first thing that we're going to do is talk about cost per transport. So you can see what my total expenses were then, and you see my transports were 1,576. So the math for determining your cost per transport is really simple. You just um, divide your expenses by your um, total transports, and you get the cost per transport. And as you see in my case, that cost per transport is $2,450. Well, when you go through a lot of the literature, and one of the things that I could never understand is they only talk about cost, cost per transport, cost per unit hour. Could there be an inverse that you could apply to it as in your revenue per transport as well. So even when Eric's presentation earlier in the day, when he was telling you about income statements, right? He, he talked to you about balance sheets and he talked to you about cash flow. Well, this is another tool that you can use to determine how you're performing. How are, are your revenues comparing to your cost per transport? And in this example, we have three primary uh, or two primary um, services that we offer at UPASS. We have our EMS division, which is the 911 ambulance division. And then we have our PACT program that stands for Paramedic Advanced Care Team. And that is our community paramedic program, our crisis response, behavioral health, our telehealth, and our community paramedic program. And what's interesting is you're going to see in the next slide that cost per transport, for example, works really well for the EMS side. It does not work really well, however, for the PAC side. The EMS side relies heavily on transports, right? The community paramedic program and the behavioral health program focuses on not transporting patients to the hospital, um, connecting patients through telehealth to other medical resources, even when it comes to a lot of the behavioral health crisis um, that, that we deal with up in Teller County, you don't transport these patients to the hospital and frequently you don't even have to transport those patients to a behavioral health facility. You can refer them to other mental health resources. You can do telehealth with mental health professionals. So once again, the goal for the PACT and the community paramedic program is to get the appropriate resources at the best cost at the right time. So even when you take a look at my chart here, um, you notice that my, on my EMS um, 911 side, you can see I look at both response and transports. And of course, we know that responses don't pay, right? Transports do, but so you can see the difference in the variation between the two. You see that it's costing me um, right down there about $2,302, but I'm bringing in about $2,957. So I'm making about five, I can't see that number very well, but $655. It looks like I'm making a boat load of money 
on my transports, right? Well, just like a lot of you, this year, I have had a staffing shortage. So that revenue that I'm making at the moment, when I'm looking at it, it's like, wow, that's, that, that, that's a lot of money. What that actually represents on this financial statement is expenses I didn't have to pay this year. I wish I could have paid because instead of operating three ambulances consistently, 24 seven, 365, because of my staffing shortage, I only ran two ambulances, 24 seven, 365, especially through the summertime. We did get as many people as we could um, to work extra shifts and overtime, um, but that has a cost as well. And I'll show you that in just a moment. Next slide. Okay, so this is where we go into cost and revenue per unit hour. It's another way of looking at the performance of your system. And it's another way of seeing how much your revenue is exceeding or um, is over your cost per unit hour. And so let Excel do as much of the work as possible. So you have to start off with, when you're determining your cost per unit hour, you have to determine what period you're talking about. And in this example, um, you have a start date and you have an end date. You put that in to your Excel spreadsheet and it calculates how many number of days you're talking about. Since throughout the year, I could only deploy two units instead of three, they work 24 hours. So my total unit hours per day was 24 or 48. So you multiply that 48 by 303, and that gives you the 14,544 unit hours that we are going to be deploying. So then you come over here um, to your, your calculations. So you see from a whole system wide, um, my cost per unit hour was about $205 and $65. Um, my revenue on the other hand was 320. So I was making on average of $55 over uh, my cost per unit hour. So I can break it down. You can see the examples. For the EMS side, we were making $63 per unit hour. But see, for me, this is the measurement for the community paramedic program. You can see that it costs about $223 a unit hour to operate the ambulance. Look at the community paramedics, $77 per, per unit hour. And even though I'm running a deficit at the moment of $52 per unit hour, I'm sorry, $25 per unit hour, that amount is also easily absorbable on the EMS side or, or, or as uh, the entire budget. Um, some of the interesting things about that is, I mean, we have a great behavioral health partner, Beacon, um, who funds the lion's share of our behavioral health program. And believe it or not, um, and I don't know what it is of reason, Private payers are starting to pay for telehealth and community paramedicine. And I'll tell you, it's only been within the last 45 to 60 days that we've really seen it. Um, it's not a lot of money yet, but it's, it is around seven to $8,000 that we are receiving now from some of the commercial payers and a government payer. This one's probably going to startle you a little bit. TRICARE is paying us now for a lot of these community paramedic um, visits and telehealth visits that we're performing for, for them and their community. I have a question about that. Yes, sir. Is that, are you guys uh, involving like a nurse practitioner to be able to have, you know, to, to be able to justify that or? No. How does that work? No. So what we're doing is obviously the documentation. For each question. I like to wonder. So um, the question was, 
for the payment, especially from the commercial payers, are we involving like a nurse practitioner, a PA, or an, or I guess you could really say a provider with their own NPI? Exactly. Okay, so yeah. that's what you're asking. The answer is no, um, we are not. And we are actually using the AO998 and AO999 billing codes um, to bill for this. Also, remember one of the other important aspects of your billing is also your documentation. So we clearly define that this is a community paramedic or behavioral health type call that we're billing for. I think with some of the workforce shortages that we're having, um, at the, I mean, you could speculate all day long as far as why are they starting to pay for this? Um, but there are a lot of advocacy efforts out there. Whether you're talking about MedStar Mobile Medical down in the Fort Worth area, they've done a lot of work with insurance companies on trying to get the community paramedic type stuff paid. Um, I think the payers are starting to catch on that you can effectively, safely see patients out in the field, treat them, connect them to other medical professionals like a physician via telehealth. You can get a diagnosis. You can get a care plan developed, you can get prescriptions filled, and you can even deliver the prescriptions to some people who have transportation problems. So we're, we're, we're starting, that's the good news is we're starting to see activity uh, movement on the community paramedic mobile integrated health side. Yes, sir. Yeah, Tim, um, for the community paramedic side, you have to have your home health care license though to really bill for that, right? Like, I don't think we can do it if we don't have that license, right? You know, what's interesting is, um, especially for consumer... Okay, so the, the question was, do you have to have a home health care license to be able to bill for these services? The interesting thing is, is I don't know the answer to that quite yet, okay? There is a license out there that it's called the Community Integrated Health Agency license. We have that. Ironically, it is a home health license. It is a, I believe it's a class three home health license. The cool thing about having that license is the, the, that license differs from ambulance licensing in that it is issued through the state versus your ambulance license that is issued to the county. Theoretically, there are similarities from a standpoint for consumer protections, but the consumer protection rules and regulations that state license offers is completely different than what a lot of the activities that happen at the county level. Yes, sir. I can actually speak to that if you don't mind. Sure. Question. So, but would you come up here so that they, no. okay, so everybody can hear you? No, I'm not a presenter. Um, so, you can, uh, you, you do know how to use a microphone. Roughly. I'll talk loud. Okay. So, the AO998 and AO999 codes are not specifically community paramedic codes. Correct. Those are, they're specifically the coding language is like, uh, non-ambulance transport treatment in place. So those codes were originally developed outside of the CP structure. And there are agencies I know of in Colorado who use those codes for treat and release with their 911 units who have no CP licensure. Cool. Where you have to be careful in Colorado is that if you're utilizing that code with your 911 truck doing a treat and release, the state doesn't care. But if you're sending a paramedic out in a fly car to go do that solo, then the state of Colorado says, uh, that's kind of CP. And if you're going to do that, you have to have a kiss license. Correct. So you. it's more just, it doesn't so much apply to billing. It's more about playing by the rules the state has in effect. Great point. Great point. 
I'm sorry? Can you repeat it online? Oh, you really did. Need to, I thought you were just going to smart No, <laughs> no, no. It, um, so if I'm paraphrasing what you just said, um, there is a difference between providing ambulance services and community paramedic services, especially using the AO998 billing code. And I think the AO998 billing code was primarily set up when it was set up because it was that all purpose billing code that whatever didn't fall into the other ALS, non emergent, ALS2, whatever those codes are, it was the AO998 that you used for everything else. The interesting thing that Mr. Farnsworth was saying is that, and especially as it pertains to the Community Integrated Health Agency license, is there are certain things that you can do on an ambulance license, and there are certain things you can't uh, by state rule and by statute. And so if you're going to send a person out to do non-traditional care, if you will, or non-traditional care that's normally done in an ambulance, you need, you have to have that community integrated health agency license to do that. So um, yeah, good point. Any questions on this? Once again, it's, it's kind of a modification of a term that we've heard of, we're used to, cost per unit hour. But if you have a cost per unit hour, can you do it revenue per unit hour? And the math is essentially the same. Um, so you can take a look at how you're performing, just like another view from the income statement, um, balance sheet, and cash flow statement. So I thought this whole concept of UHUs for several years because Number one, I didn't get them for the longest time. Um, so I didn't fully understand their applicability to what it is we do every single day. And even when I thought of payers and payments, nobody pays me by cost per unit hour, right? They pay me based on cost per transport, right? Is that true? I'll have an example for you in the future slide to show you that that's not true. There is um, a connection between cost per unit hour um, that applies to how we're paid. But there's a lot of ways that you can use UHUs. And as Ted referred to them, I think it was uh, um, productivity and workload. Transport workload, but productivity is a good, a good Correct. Well, some of those things that I've been following lately, they're talk about response UHU, which would be your workload. workload UHU. And then of course the transport UHU is the transport UHU. But before you can really move into what your response UHU and your transport UHU are, you have to figure out what your base unit hour utilization is. And so you take those total hours that you're deploying units, you divide those by your transport, and you get a base unit of one. Well, for me, in my numbers, I get a base unit of one. So just for the fun of it, and even, and kudos to Ted, Ted is the one who really helped me understand uh, what these mean. So then I took a look at my response UHU. Hey, Tim? Uh huh. Cool. Could you call your base transport a readiness UHU? Yes. <laughs> yes, it's part of the, the, of part the readiness of the UHU. Yeah, and, and, and that's coming up in just a moment. It's easy to have Yeah. So the reason why you have to figure out your base UHU is most services calls are not an hour long, right? How many services in the room, their call, or their transport is only an hour. I see no hands coming up. So, and in my service, all calls, whether it be cancels, refusals, transports, the overall average is an hour and 15 minutes. 
So that's 1.25 hours for my tax. So what I do is um, figure out my responses, my base UHU. I multiply that once again by my task time, and I get a response UHU of 0 0.30. So what that tells me is 30% of the time that my crews are deployed, they are doing something directly related to their primary role as paramedics and EMTs, responding to calls. That's what that is. That 30 or 0.3 UHU is really high. What that doesn't capture though, how much time does it take to write the trip report? How much time does it take to check out the car and wash the car? How much time does it take to um, clean the station? How much time does it take to do extra duties? Because for my staff, everybody has an extra duty, whether it's vehicle maintenance, it's uh, supply, it's facilities maintenance, it's CQI, it's education. So even when I look at that and with my base unit of two, two ambulances, to me, that says that's unsustainable. All last summer, I heard crews complaining about too many calls, too many forms, too many things to do. And I really didn't have a measurement from a management standpoint to say, ooh, yeah, you're right. Point three, as my base, tells me that that's unsustainable for them. It's going to start causing me turnover, more turnover problems, uh, more unhappy employees. So I have to think about opportunities. And one of them could be, well, you can add another car, right? Another transport car. That's really expensive to do. What are some of your other options that you can do to decrease the workload on the crews? Well, a lot of the private services do things like VSTs, okay? So you can hire somebody, an EMT, somebody who knows something about the business, Maybe when your shift starts at eight o'clock in the morning, maybe they come in at 7.30 in the morning and they start checking out the cars, making certain they're, they have all the equipment, make certain it has gas, diesel. They wanna put gas in a diesel. Mm -hmm. um, and they're restocking the ambulances. They're helping the crews throughout the day, keep the station clean, mowing the grass, doing whatever. That could be a potential lower cost solution to a big high cost problem. So it gives you the opportunity to be able to actually look at what are your options, your available options um, to solve a problem. Well, the other interesting thing regarding UHUs is now I have my transport UHU, right? So you're looking at your response UHU and you see a three with the transport UHU of 0.18 says is out of the 30% of the things that they're doing on ambulance related calls, only 18% of those calls are potentially revenue generating calls. Get that? Only 18% because obviously um, we run a lot of refusals, cancellations, treat and releases that we don't get paid for. And you can even use some of this for advocacy efforts because one of the things we really need as an industry is payment for treat and release. But so you can start using some of these numbers to help you achieve, achieve, to achieve other goals. Next, please. So you've heard about cost of readiness. <laughs> I'm a wanderer. Sorry, I'll wave to everybody out in video land. And if I'm over here, I'll wave so at least you know I'm still here. So, what is readiness? Readiness really is all the costs associated with having an ambulance that is equipped, staffed, insured. Um, those are all the costs that are associated with having enough 
ready resources within your community, correct? How do you determine, how do you practically try to figure that out? Here's where UHU comes in again. Next slide, please. So, cost of readiness. Why is this so important? As Ted alluded to, and I think a couple of the other presenters earlier today said, payers don't want to pay the cost of readiness. They only want to pay the incremental cost of the transport itself. So if we can get the transports paid, how the HE double thunder are we going to get the rest of that pay, right? If we know the numbers, if we really know what it means, then we can help utilize that valuable information in advocacy efforts to try to get that fixed. So you use your transport UHU to figure this out. Once again, you put your costs up there. Your UHU, you divide 18%. You take the $3,861,000 divided by 18% tells you what your transport related costs are. In my case, you see it's $707,571. The readiness costs are now the $3,153,572. Now, what a lot of folks out there in the national side of the house, even EMS folks, and even the payers are saying, readiness, that's your issue. That's the local issue. The problem with that being solely a local issue, how are some of your, and I know that the expenses will be much different in frontier and rural areas, but practically, even if you could convince the taxpayers to fund you with a 10 mil, mil levy to help fund EMS, where's the assessed value to really make that 10 mil valuable enough to pay for the readiness costs. It's just not there. So we have to find ways, other ways potentially of funding the readiness costs. The reason why I circled and because you can even take it down to not only the total values, but you can take it down to the transport costs once again. And I circled the $454. Once again, does that number kind of look familiar? <laughs> I'm still on screen. Does that look familiar? Does that look like what a Medicare rate is? Base rate and mileage? Because Medicare is, was the first group that started this whole nonsense by saying, I only want to pay for the transport costs. I don't want to pay for the readiness costs. However, maybe some of the good news that would be coming up in the future, which is why we all really need to be prepared and complete the Medicare cost reporting. The whole reason why we're doing this is so that CMS and Medicare can have a better idea of what it's truly costing us to provide ambulance services. And we're hoping, and I use the word hope, that maybe they'll pay more of the costs that are associated with providing services over the long run. Because somehow, if you can't get that $2,022 paid, you don't provide the service. And even when you think of some of these rural agencies and these frontier agencies, in the rural environments, it's getting, they're getting smaller, they're getting older, and they're getting sicker. That's kind of the status of a lot of our small super rural and frontier counties. So even if you had the people out there, you don't necessarily have the people with the capacity, if you will, to lift the cots in the middle of the night um, or the, the people that are really interested in providing EMS services. So even if they had to switch to some sort of a hybrid system where they have some paid and some volunteers, they still have to pay for that. So that would come into the readiness cost. Next slide, please. Gonna start wrapping up my 
portion of the presentation by giving you an example of how we at UPass Regional Health Service District determine what we're going to charge on an ambulance bill. And I wish Randy was, Randy is still here. <laughs> Good, because he'll probably have comments about this at the end as well. So according to the American Ambulance Association, rates charged are a function of cost per transport and collection percentage, okay? Why do you think collection percentage is part of this calculation? Any ideas? That's what we're gonna get. Yeah? We get to make up for what people don't pay. That's exactly it. And so remember earlier in the day, I, I asked a couple of people, how and where do you fit the cost of uncompensated care into your budget, your rates? Because we know cost, we know what our costs, and when we think generally of what costs are, our fuel, our salaries, we know where we can find that number. That's on the PL, right? Or in our budget as we work through our budget and PL. The other cost that we have to get is the cost of the uncompensated care. Next slide. Oh, so before we do that, some of the information that you need are the total expenses from your most recent, or if you're determining what your rates are gonna be at the beginning of the year, you need that from what your proposed budget is. You also need to know, are there any prepayments on those expenses? And for me, in, at UPASS, we have two. Actually, you have three. Um, two of them are related, but those are property taxes, specific ownership taxes, and we also have a sales tax that helps support our service. Going back a slide for readiness costs, it's those three revenue sources that are paying for most of the readiness costs. So my local community said, yes, we'll step up and we'll help you pay for those. The other thing you need to know now is the supplemental reimbursement program payment. That's how they actually refer to it as the SPP. You've also heard it referred to as the SRP, which is a supplemental reimbursement program. And you've also probably heard to it referred to, especially um, in the fire circles as the GEMT. Um, I think that stands for Ground Emergency Transport um, uh, Fund. So you also have to know what your total billable transports are or what you're projecting them to be in your budget. Your collection percentage, that accounts for the cost of uncompensated care. And then you need to perform the calculations. Next slide and question. Um, when you're talking about collection rate, are you talking call revenue collection rate or total revenue? To collection rate off of gross bill. Okay, so call revenue. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here's my payer mix. So there's a couple columns that are left out of it, um, partly because I wanted to make certain that it didn't get so wide that you couldn't see the numbers either in the room or on the screen. What's one of those num columns that isn't there on the payer mix? No. Contractual. The contractual bad debt. Because you know that somewhere in there with Medicare, you're going to bill them $1.9 million. You're not going to collect that $1.9 million. So you have to automatically account for that. And that goes in there. I'm just going to give you the number because how did I go from gross to net? Because I have contractuals, whether it's the Medicaid amount, it's the VA, um, it's TRICARE, it's there. So for me, that number would have been $2,344,731. Would have been that bottom line of that column between gross and net. Well, another thing I like to point out is so many services 
look at their revenue, if you will, as cash per trip. Is cash per trip an average payment the same? Well, you can look at my chart and see it's not. Because it looks like from a cash per trip standpoint, hmm, doing pretty good, especially on the insurance side, right? Problem that we're seeing is, especially on the commercial insurance payer side, and if you're not paying attention to this, and if your billing company isn't paying attention to this, insurance companies are doing tons and tons and tons of underpayments. They're not paying according to the insurance plan. So we've had to do a lot of appeals to get that, that at the, the, the amount that the insurance is supposed to pay. So that's why it's important that you take a look at both your average payment and where do you find the information for your average payment? It's in your credit summary. Every month your insurance, your billing company should be sending you a credit summary. So even from the activity summary, which your, a lot of your payer mix is based on, you know that they billed 773 trips to Medicare on your credit summary, you're going to see we received 428 payments from Medicare. And this is the amount. You're going to see that we received 60 payments from Medicaid. You're going to see a whole bunch of payments numbers for an amount that relates back to insurance. Insurance is one of the biggest culprits. And, you know, we've looked, we've audited, um, I have to see, and, and, I, and I've had conversations with my billing company, Michelle, about the EOBs when they come through. Looking to see, and not only from an EOB standpoint, were they billed out appropriately in the first place? We're not seeing where there was an error on the billing side. It's on the payment side. And the other interesting thing that we've seen, how many patients or how many services experience payments to patients instead of to providers? We see that a lot, right? The interesting thing for us is we're seeing through the appeals process, we're getting the underpayment paid quickly and directly. But the problem is, is they're sending a lot of the um, appeal payments to the patients. Now we're one of the luckier services, I think, that a lot of our community does forward um, those payments to us, especially of recent. And even when you take a look at that private pay, those without insurance, we, when we send out a bill that we know it's gonna be insurance is gonna pay the patient, that's where that goes, a lot of it. And then, but for this example, I did move them up, but um, we still have a lot of, of insurance payments that are going into that category. But for continuing on, that's my collection rate. 27% collection rate. Next slide, please. So here's EMS <laughs> finance and bill according to Tim. Tim is the one who came up with this. He did some research like with what the American Ambulance Association says on how rates should be determined. And the interesting thing is when I think about this aspect, when somebody, there should be billing transparency in whatever we do, right? We should have a method, a methodology that we use to justify the cot or the, the bills that we're sending out to patients and providers or other payers. So it's very simple. And what this is, this is once again based on my October 31st financials because I compare what the average bills are to even what I budgeted for at the beginning of the year. So this is my total expenses. Since some of those expenses were prepaid, I subtract 
that from the expenses. So then I have the amount that I have to finance, if you will, through my patient billing activities. So I divide that by the total number of transports that I had during that period. And I come up with $686.26. So well, if you go back to my payer mix, go back one slide, please. I have a really sucky payer mix. 78% of every bill I send out goes to Medicare, Medicaid, and the uninsured. So they don't even come close to paying what my average payment is forward. Cost of uncompensated care, that collection percentage. So essentially what you do um, is you divide that cost, the 686.21 by 27%, and you'll find out that the average bill to account for costs and the uncompensated costs of care needs to be $2,525.99. Obviously, if you can increase your revenues that you're receiving, that impacts your collection percentage, right? Next slide. So this is where the SPP comes in to my payer mix. And so if you take a look at the Medicaid line, that was the big difference right there. I would never thought at the moment, I'd see the day where I'd say, ooh, bring me some more Medicaid patients. Even though the SPP only pays up to 50% of your costs, it helps a lot because now my average payment from a Medicaid standpoint is because that's even from my activity summary, it's those payments that I received throughout the year from my Medicaid plus one, right? Because that was my SPP payment. So at least I'm consistent, may not be correct, but at least I'm consistent. You see my collection percentage went up to 35%. Okay, yes, sir. Is that when you say the SPP is based off your cost per transport, is that your self reported cost or what Medicaid says your cost per transport should be? Okay, so Teresa may be a better person to answer that question. So, okay, so the question was okay, ask the question again. <laughs> is that you, you said the SPP payment is based off of up to 50% of your cost per transport. Allowable, so that, allowable. What you're saying the cost is or what you're reporting your cost is? What you're reporting your cost based on Medicare or Medicaid claims. So Sean is going to potentially get a lot more money per call with 400 transports per year because his cost per transport is much higher then you pass is going to get with a lower, is that accurate or not? I don't think that's accurate. And I'm gonna kind of look at Teresa here. Um, I, I would say that's not accurate because his fire side doesn't count. It has to oh, be no. the EMS yes. portion. Yes, it has so to be the fire EMS side portion. Count. Tim is going to be 100% cost. But you see the program only goes up to 50, it doesn't cover your whole cost. It only covers 50% of your cost, well, which is better than reimbursing for like eight. But either way, the question still remains, is it based on if, if, if the cost per call at my agency, which is also pure EMS, is say $900 per call is our cost. Let's just make up a number. Your cost is 500 per call. Does that mean we're gonna potentially get reimbursed 400? $50? It, or, it, it depends on how many Medicaid yes. transports you have. I, I get that, it, but I'm back to the question, who defines my cost per call? Is Medicaid setting what the cost per call is? Or am I telling them this is my cost per call? They're telling you, you're telling them. So you're not telling them what your cost per call or cost per transport is. Actually, what you're doing is you are reporting 
all of your applicable costs, right? Just like in an, and, and I think it actually it also includes revenues. Is that right? Yeah, they pull the revenues. Yep. Yep. Their data, so yep. So it's all the costs, and then they put in the amount that pertains of those costs that pertain specifically to Medicaid. They come up with that cost that is specifically related to the Medicaid, total Medicaid impact. Then they divide that in half. So that's your theoretical SPP start payment. Then what they do is they subtract from that payment what you've already been paid by Medicaid. In my case, for example, you could say that, well, it would be in two slides back, but what my fee for service Medicaid amount would be $53,000. And then that becomes your settlement, your settlement pay. And the interesting thing is that applies inequitably, I might add. It applies to the public providers. It does not apply to the private providers, for profit or nonprofit. Um, there is a program that they could potentially participate in. See, and, and the private providers can't participate um, in the SPP because it's based on certified public expenditures. And our match is based on those certified public expenditures. More specifically, every dollar we spend is considered a public expenditure and that's our match, right? So there is a program that the privates could, could participate in. It's called an FRA, which is a federal reimbursement allowance program. And if you've ever heard, have you ever heard of the hospital provider fee? That's in the state of Colorado that helps especially a lot of the rural hospitals. The hospital provider fee is, is an FRA but what happens is the match for the Fed, for the enhanced federal drawdown has to come from the providers. So they have to pay into a bank um, and they get a reimbursement that's essentially two to two and a half dollars based on every dollar that they put into it. And that additional dollar and a half, if you will, comes from the, the enhanced federal drawdown um, that would go to, to them. But anyway, when you take a look at my collection percentage, next slide, please. See what it does? Once again, and to be consistent, you do the same thing. You start off with what your expenses are. You take off your prepaid amount. Then you come up with the um, amount that has to be paid for. So it's, it's essentially the same amount, but a 35 collection rate dramatically reduces what your average bill should be. Next slide, please. Okay, now, yes, sir. Does uh, secondary insurance come into this or tertiary insurance? Like when you look at coordination of benefits, how does that play into it? As far as like your, so, the supplemental payments, yeah, supplemental sure. insurance, especially as it pertains to Medicare, right? Sure. Absolutely. So absolutely. And that even impacts when you think about the total number of payments that you receive. Right. So you obviously get the payment from Medicare. Right. That's one payment, that's right? Right. And then you get the supplemental payment. If they have supplemental insurance, that's the second payment yeah. to get the total amount of the payment, right? Because Medicare only pays up to 80% of the Medicare allowable rates. Mm -hmm. It's the patient's responsibility to pay the other 20%. If the patient has supplemental insurance, then that 20% comes from them. Right. Correct. And then oftentimes what I what I hear is billing companies, you know, they're really good about going after the first one, but not necessarily supplemental or second or third, just because they don't even water. Yeah. So how do you hold them accountable to that? Okay, so ask the question again. Just that coordination of benefits, like the secondary and tertiary insurances, you know, if they are part of the picture of payment, billing services are, are traditionally really good about going after, you know, the first one, but maybe not the second or third. 
So the question is that a lot of in billing companies are really good at going after the Medicare payment, right, mm -hmm. directly, but they may not be as good at going after the secondary insurance as well. First of all, as an EMS administrator and compliance related, it's your responsibility as an EMS um, provider to make certain that that is gone after, that your billing company actually does that. Sure. And there's a lot of components that may relate back to not getting that payment. Some of that could go back to your staff and your crews. Are they getting that information in the first place for them to bill? Um, and sometimes that goes back to even your, your providers getting insurance, face sheets, whatever it is in the first place. So they have to do that. They have to understand that that's part of their job. Paychecks come from money, right? And the only way that you can get the money for the paychecks is to make certain that you have those dedicated revenue streams, whether it's taxes or just as important is the payment from commercial payers. Paychecks come from money. If there's no money, there's no paychecks. So my last slide, I'm talking about fair health databases. And I, I think I'm, I'm early, aren't I? Because it's gonna take you a minute to get to the fair health database. So on your computer screen, can you get out of it? And then let's write that down, fairhealthconsumer.org. There's, there's a point to this. You'll see it in just a minute. Fairhealthconsumer.org. Uh, so and this is something I learned about um, at the EMS World Expo from Matt Savatsky that I think can be valuable to you. Why can't I close this down? So if you, I think if you, you have to go back up top to your screen sharing. It's, it's like you fill in with. Go ahead to our searching real quick, a couple yep. of gaps that I identified. So, uh, <clears throat> just here again, a, a uh, couple of gaps that I think that we did fill in for you guys. Just ended your screen. No, I think, oh, I think you just ended. No, it's, it's just down. It's still, still here. Okay. okay, we're still going. Okay, so a couple of gaps that I, I, I think we, we we didn't fill in completely for you guys is on the UHU. Um, the, the value of creating a budgeted UHU. So if you're budgeting for X number of transports and, and uh, um, X number of unit hours, create a budgeted UHU. So then you can take that UHU and you can use it as real-time forecasting on how you're doing compared to budget. So I think we failed to really make that link for you. So if you, you can watch even hourly what your UHU is doing and know how you're, you're performing for your, for, for your budget. So... Um, also, if you establish a baseline of either of those UHUs, it's amazing how, how you're able to apply those UHUs to other things in your, your, your in your business practice. So, are we up to moment? Okay. Uh, I was just going to. Oh, no, that's fine. So, I, I have a yeah. question. Okay. around UHU. Yes. Um, oftentimes, I get agencies that will ask me, you know, KPIs just yep. as an industry standard. Key point, key point is there, like, in your opinion, is there a place? I know there's so many variables, especially state right. to state, but is there a place that they can look up, like, what's the standard or what, how to measure against? I'm not aware of any database where you can get. Uh, just don't date. repeat the question. Sure, yeah. The question was Is there a, a standard location where a person could go and see what common KPIs or key point indicators are located at? Yeah. Um, I, I, I would guess look at the American Ambulance Association, where I would look, but I don't know for the fact that they have them. Um, but you almost have to do a little bit of strategic planning in your own organization and identify key information for you. What are your, your drivers in your organization? So, um, but certainly UHU is, is common place for that. Um, as well, and, and then also while I'm speaking, because you had you had made a, a comment earlier about um, the impact of contracted rates, 
Um, and we certainly touched that on from a public perspective, but from a private company perspective, when you're talking about nursing homes or, or hospital facilities, you know, the perception was always out there that um, <clears throat> 911 uh, or, or agencies that do ball kind of fund the 911 system on based on the inner facility business. But these contracted rates can be so low that it, and so impactful that it's almost a wash sometimes. So I just wanted to have that comment about your part, your comment about that. So. Uh, Jim, I don't know if they're to So go back to your internet. Oh, it's here. This is it. Should be it. Nope, that's my screen. That's the, that's the oh. slideshow. Yeah, you can need to go back to your browser. <laughs> Stop sharing. Stop screen sharing. Ugh. Go down here, your internet browser. Okay, so and share, this is the thing. Share that. Share. Oh, say I have to share. Yeah. So you should be able oh, to share, share your screen. Wrong, I shared the wrong thing. Yeah, you should share it. Okay. So just share the green line thing. Okay. Yeah. I can be taught. It's hard, but I can be taught. <laughs> okay, so this is kind of a cool little tool to try to find out what your realistic insurance payments should be based on this database, which the information comes from the all claims database. Um, this is actually something that's used by consumers when, the, when they're theoretically shopping and comparing um, for healthcare. Um, it tells you, well, let's, let's just kind of go through the step and we'll use my service as an example. So Kim, if you'll press search for medical and hospital costs. Okay. so. I'm not certain if I want to see an in-network or out-of-network um, cost, right? So hit next. Next, right? See, yeah. that's it. Why am I even sitting here? Okay. <laughs> so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to put in 80863. And then you're going to no, make, yep, there you go. Sure. All right, so what do we want to price? Well, oh, since, since this is, <laughs> leave it to the dork in the room, and I thought that was me. <laughs> Ambulance transportation. We'll find out. There you go. All right, so we want ground ambulance. I agree. Okay, so let's just choose the code um, A0427, which is transferred by Ambulance Advanced Life Cells. Get your cost. All right, so does some of this look familiar from the in-network price versus the out-of-network price based on some of the previous slides that the out-of-network insured price is $2,447. Got that? Next thing, C out of network reimbursement. So for Kim. So what this does is this tells you on average what insurance companies should be paying when it relates, especially to out of district costs or out of network costs. So typical plan. Typical plan will pay at the 70% 70, 70 of charges. So they should be paying at least $1,714 for that. So your out of pocket cost for the consumer would be 733. That's for the base rate. <laughs> Some of it doesn't make sense. I don't understand why medical supplies, I think that goes back once again to the base rate. But you can actually go down and see what they should be paying for your mileage as well. But you also can see some of the other things that they're paying, like disposable supplies. They could be paying up to $123 for that. Hmm. Go down. And um, an EKG. You can do $35 for an EKG charge. So rather than bundling, you need to break it out? Maybe we should be 
filling the medical supplies AO425. And there could be a CPT code that we could use for, I don't know. I don't necessarily understand where that 50 and 35, because we, we build base rate miles. So I'm not necessarily certain where that comes from, unless they're saying that based on that AO427 or whatever that is, at least that amount maybe is what they're reimbursing for. Anyway, um, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Um, any questions, everybody except you? <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> is that something that anybody can access? Yeah. If we... I would be careful on how many times, like in a day, that you go into it because it will lock you out. It is, it is meant to be primarily a consumer. Um, but if you want to see. Um, well, it's not necessarily for myself, but when people call up and say, you charge way, way, way too much, and I'm not. Can I give them that website? Yes. yes. And not only can you give them that website, they can look and see what their insurance paid versus what the typical plan should have paid. Just tell them what Tim charges. Yes. <laughs> Once again, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Ambulance finance, according to Tim. You're about the same price as calling out. <laughs> <laughs> but that too that too for a lot of physician practices and um are negotiated rates um the lot those the payers don't negotiate with ems and actually um i think some of the some of the other things to kind of remember is who is valuing whose services right so if we have a structured mechanism, I don't like my bills that I'm sending out. I'm not proud of my bills that go out my door. However, I'll stand by my charges because I have a system to figure it out that I can, I can, even when somebody calls up, even if they don't like it, I can tell them how we figured out what we charged and why. As opposed to saying, I did like a good rate. Somehow it fit in there. Um, I compare it to other services to see what, well, what are you charging? What are you charging? Okay, so I'm going to charge close to the high end to whoever that was. Um, I can defend the charges that we're charging. And I think that for price transparency, that's just as important, <clears throat> if not more important, to be able to describe and define how you come up with your rates. Speaking of um, price transparency, we have our um, pricing listed on our website. You think it's a good idea? Yeah. Just to so say, hey, sure. look, it's yeah. right there. It's sure. not hidden. People don't. So putting your charges and prices on your website for char price charge uh, transparency, actually, that's a great idea. I mean, they'll still use it against you because it's like, I didn't go to your website before I dialed 911. But still, it's, it, it is good. It's, it's good public information. And I maybe, don't do that, but I, that's actually a great idea. It might be a good idea on the same page to put the Fair Health Consumer website. Yeah. Just maybe. Right below that Don't section agree. on your website that says, I'd like to make a payment. <laughs> Are there any questions from the audience online? Mr. Schallender. No, no, we have not. So either I gave you a bunch of gobbledygook and nobody and everybody's completely confused and don't know what to ask. Um, or like how you go out of there and go back and look at the helicopter price. Same thing, you just go back. So, and you're right there, eight, uh, yeah. 426, the helicopter price. Click that one. Four, yeah, yeah. Now, that, 
So let's take a look at this. Go back to this one here. See the out of network. Oh. That could so be the, that could be the most valuable thing you got out of the entire presentation. <laughs> So at least ended on a high note. So the question is, is a typical charge the same dollar amount per mile between the facility, whether or not it's emergent or non-emergent? Same per mile. I think the in 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 add in here, I think that comes into your charges as far as your base rate. Your mileage will probably stay the same, your mileage rate. Um, but your base rate will be different because it, it goes back to a higher cost um, service that you're providing. I mean, I think Sean even referenced earlier that in some respects, it doesn't, it doesn't change the cost of providing services, whether it's, I mean, if an ALS go, truck goes out and does a BLS call, that cost did not really change. Um, however, it could change if you, I don't know, gave the penophyrene and all these other drugs that we carry on our ambulances, because I say penophyrene, because the more I become an administrator, I, I, I become more of a DSIVPSF with transfer driver, Sherpa, IV pole, stretcher, fetcher. Um, <laughs> your mileage cost does not change. But the mileage cost would not change, but your base rate would. And even from a standpoint of Medicare billing, there is the SCT transport, but you have to meet specific criteria and you can only apply it in the IFT. You have- it, uh, one, one twist on that is when you start getting into contracts. So, um, so if you're contracted with a, a, a facility, um, you know, that's all negotiated. So there certainly is a difference between retail or 911. Um, mileage and contracted rates, um, whether it's Medicaid, Medicare, or whether it's a facility negotiated uh, mileage rate. So it, it can, so the answer is maybe, so. We're seeing, yeah, we're seeing those even tiered on response times too. Like if yeah. you said, yeah. hey, I'm gonna be there in 45 minutes and it's three hours, your rate now got yeah. cut in half yeah. in that negotiation. Sure can, sure can. So, <laughs> tell him what he said. Okay. Yeah, um, so what he said that you're even seeing it uh, you know, as far as reimbursement based upon the response times for these contracted um, payments. So, if you're there, are contracts out there that if you're too slow in getting to the transport, that the, the reimbursement is negatively impacted for sure. How do agencies figure out what to charge per mile? You said you were going to touch on it, but you have. Anybody can answer, ask a question except you and you. So, next question. So, <laughs> so you know the. Repeat the question. So, how it's essentially how do you determine your cost per mile, right? And so, there's multiple ways that you can do that. One of the cool things is through the calculation that I showed you. That tells you what your minimum total charge going out the door per transport needs to be, right? So take a look at your other data to find out, um, I mean, how many calls do you run? How many transport miles do you run? Um, um, you can use that data to help determine what's a base rate and what is a mileage fee. You can also take a look at um, some of the reimbursable amounts on, on the um, all claims data to see what they pay for mileage. I don't have a good explanation for that, to be quite honest with you. But what I can tell you is I can give you a great start of what your average bills should be. And you can use your other data to help decide what your mileage rate should be okay i mean i wish i had a better answer for you but i don't maybe ted does I mean, and, and i don't think i have a completely better answer I, I, I would factor in maintenance cost fuel cost all your vehicle costs 
divided by how many miles do you guys drive in a given year? Um, make sure that I'm covering that for sure. So. He's a smart guy. I'm just here because I look good. <laughs> You're better than me. <laughs> that's why it was a cheap conference. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> questions. Any other questions? Because if nothing else, I'll say it with conviction. And if I do that, you'll believe it, right? So, any other questions? Any other questions online? No. I would just make the comment that that air ambulance bracing is an excellent example of inelastic demand, that they've gone all the way up the Y axis. Um, and that's not going to change their quantity demanded at all. It's probably also an excellent example of value based pricing. They've subdivided in that rate structure that um, an air ambulance is worth probably more than it costs to spin that rotor for 25 minutes. Um, so that's an excellent example of how that plays through on that side of the fence. Questions going once. Wow. How much did you pay that person to say that to? Well, <laughs> I will neither confirm nor deny. <laughs> are you are you guys done? I, I I do believe that was my last my last slide. Yeah. Why don't Why don't Eric and uh, John and Flesher? Is he still here? Yeah. Yeah. Why don't you come up to the front? <laughs> yeah, we keep hoping he's left, but you know, you you guys come up to the front and let's just have an open Q and A. You want us to bring a chair? No, I want you to stand. Okay. Because <laughs> it, it's like a firing squad. Oh, it is. I'm just standing <laughs> So I've told those online that it's a short Q and A session. Doesn't matter the topic, just ask. So if there's questions in the room, questions online, hopefully they can hear me online. I'm kind of bellering it as I always do. So and we've got crickets because they'll probably have to go upstairs because that's the only working microphone for, um, on the camera. Yeah, that's what I'm watching. Questions in the room? Yeah, I have one question. It's more for you though. You're gonna the slide will be available after the conference, right? Yes. And rather than yell, I'll go do this in person. <laughs> Please repeat the question. Uh, yeah. yeah. So the, question, <laughs> the question was whether or not the slides would be available, uh, and they will be. I had hoped to have this done prior to the conference. But some of the presentations didn't actually show up until today. So anyway, you will be receiving in the mail. He's politely trying to say none of us cooperate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Some, some did, some did. You will be receiving in the mail a thumb drive with all of the presentations and the AAA. What's the name of it? Their document? EMS. Structured for success. EMS structured for success, about a 200 page guide from the AAA that they just uh, offered to us. So that'll also be on the thumb drive, and I'll send that out by the post office so you might get it by Christmas. <laughs> Any questions? Uh, is it coming from China? Because we never, we'll never get it. Yeah, it'll, sit, it'll be sitting on a uh, boat out there. Oh, the yes. harbor. Oh, please also fill out your evals. Uh, those of you in the room, you have evals. Those of you online, I'll be sending you evals via email so that you can fill those out and send back to me. I do appreciate it. Doesn't look like we have any questions either online or in the room. Uh, so I believe we all are done for the day. We start again tomorrow with... Uh, uh, Matt Zavatsky, I believe, is first up at 8.30. So we will see you all tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.